Hello, hello everyone. I am so excited to be here. And keeping up with the theme, I want to start off a little different. I want to start off with a song. And I really want you to listen to the words because it's not easy being an entrepreneur. It's not. We have to wear all the hats. And I just want to encourage you all for just a minute because I always like to say that you have to have a whole lot of faith and be a whole lot of crazy to live this entrepreneur life. <laughs> and so you guys are a miracle to be stepping out on faith, to be doing this work, and, and just to be living in your purpose because it's not normal to step out and create something new. So again, I want you to listen to the words and um, we're gonna play. I am the miracle, say it with me, I am the miracle. Wipe away the doubt, the disbelief, and the fear in you. Project your mind down the line about a year or two. See yourself pursuing it, then doing what you here to do. You are the miracle, yes, you are the miracle. You get what you expect, see a thousand people cheering you. You are the miracle, you and I, a miracle. This is intellectually critical and political. Yes, you are the miracle, cause faced with the imperial, we didn't lose our spiritual. That alone is a miracle. Standing on principle while others steady dissing you, but still showing love living above, that's a miracle. They tried to put the fear in you, act like they wasn't hearing you, but that was minimal, you remain the miracle. No hate or bitterness, cause both are reciprocal. Not to become hateful toward hate, that's a miracle. The rent due and the landlord, he ain't hearing you. But the check with no money on it, you gave him just planned for you. Miracle, when you pray, someone's always hearing you. Ancestors, Holy Spirit, maybe someone near to you. A miracle. Yes, you are a miracle. Fresh, you are a miracle. Bless, you are a miracle. All right, so again, I just wanna encourage you all, don't give up, it's not easy, but keep on going, keep on waking up and keep on believing in yourself and your dream. So with that being said, in that same atmosphere, I do invite everybody to stand up for a moment. And let's go ahead and close our eyes. And let's imagine that we are thriving in our business. I mean, we are killing it. Financial goals met everything. And so one thing about small business owners is we tend to think about two primary things, and that is money and people. We need seamless operations, and we need the people to execute on that. So again, we're thriving, we've tripled our revenue, and we are thinking about that ideal employee. Let's just call him Maverick for the sake of time, and let's think about all the attributes Maverick does. Maverick comes to work on time. Maverick is creative. He can create a PowerPoint in Canva and in PowerPoint. Maverick is diligent. He has the right attitude. You can leave him alone with the customer. He does it all. Now, let's switch our attention to that employee that we feel isn't a good fit. And what behaviors do we see that employee do? They may come to late. They may say things like, that's not my job. Their overall vibe isn't good. And one thing about leaders is, if we know somebody's a good, not a good fit, we either overcompensate or we make excuses. All right, good job, everyone. You can go ahead and give yourself a hand clap, sit on down, good job, good job. All right. So thank you for that welcome. Again, my name is Miracle Simeon. And if you can see the screens on either side, the one in the blue, that is Maverick. That is our perfect employee, even in the midst of chaos. He, is a, he understood the assignment. He's smiling and his little sisters are going crazy, but that's, that's a good employee. And then at the top, you'll see my whole family. And so I am the COO of Bo Professional Services and the co 
co-founder and creator of Connect Pro Software. And we often like to describe ourselves as the culture-based company because I can do all the things. I can give you a recruiting strategy. We can talk about compensation, workforce planning, all of the HR things, but that means nothing unless we address culture because we truly believe that culture is the answer to everything you can do all the things but if you don't have that culture together people will leave it's gonna feel bad and when we think about hr just as the basics there hasn't been a lot of innovation when it comes to hr we've been doing the same thing if you don't believe me let's look at the history of hr the first job description we created it in 1911. We've been doing it the same way. <laughs> the first employee handbook was created in 1920. We've been doing it the same way. And the way we do performance management, y'all, we just stole it or we adopted it from how they did World War I and they ranked soldiers. So first lieutenant, second lieutenant, somebody in personnel thought like, oh, let's do the same thing and let's do performance management the same way. So traditional measures, we're gonna look at Maverick's performance review and his sisters. Uh, per traditional performance review measures don't work. You know, they, they just set the bar. They don't teach our employees how to behave or how to excel. It's just those words that we want them to do. And even when it comes to goal setting, you know, SMART goals, we, HRs love SMART goals. <laughs> We're not teaching them the actions, the behaviors, what we want them to do. And like they said earlier, we are people who fill in the blanks. So if we use these vague language and these vague words. You have your employees just filling in the blank. And let's even thinking about it for a step further. When we're speaking to our children, do we set a goal to not jump on the bed? Or we tell them directly, this is what I want you to do. This is what I don't want you to do. And our family, she mentioned, we do have a culture that we call it the Simeon culture. When we go to the store, do not put anything in this basket. Mom's not buying it, they all know. And the beauty about it is Maverick was taught that and he teaches his sisters. So I do not have the sole responsibility of teaching them how to behave and what's acceptable is not acceptable. Maverick is doing it for me. And I'm not trying to say that your employees are kids, by all means, please. <laughs> you know, listen to the reference. I just wanted to show my cute kids, sorry. Um, but that's how it is. It's everybody's responsibility when it comes to culture. A lot of other organizations, they put it on the management, upper management. No, it's everybody's responsibility because it's so much easier when you have your employees telling them, hey, we come to work on time. Hey, we don't do this. Oh, when we have meetings, we show up, we're on camera. That's the culture of this organization. So, how many people have at least one employee? And you count yourself. So how many people have at least one employee? All the hands are raised, right? Because we count ourselves, right? So some people think, oh, when it comes to culture, you know, I, I can do it when I have 50 employees, 20 employees. No, it starts now. If you have at least one employee, you need to be able to articulate and tell me what the culture is. All the time, people say, oh, they weren't a right fit, but they can't tell me what their culture really is. And do we want to wait till we have 20, 30 employees? Because one thing about, you know, business owners, we're like, I'm going to be the example. They're going to see me and they can just see how it's supposed to act. I come in at five, I leave at 10. Your employees are not going to do that. They're going to be like, I get off at five. You're not paying me for that. And so we want to be able to tell them explicitly what we want our culture to be like. Because one day you will not be seen. You'll be, you know, on vacation somewhere and Maverick will be teaching your employees what to do because that's the goal, right? We want to be working in our business, not on our business, and being that sole doer and a prover. We don't want to do all of that. And so with that being said, let's go ahead and watch this video. We often hear the word corporate culture or workplace culture and probably wonder, 
what does it mean? There are so many different definitions, but we need to understand what it means to make sure we have a good one so that we can recruit great people, retain our best people, and make sure that we remain profitable and have a great brand. In this video, I'm gonna explain what corporate culture is in five minutes or less, so that we can make sure we can recruit great people, retain our best talent, and get rid of much of that pesky turnover that many of us are plagued with. The first thing we wanna do is define corporate culture so that we can understand what are the most important components. In order for us to understand what corporate culture is, we have to understand what it isn't. Corporate culture is not a legal entity. It is not a building. It is not walls that we walk in or a roof that we walk under. It is something completely different. Many will argue that its culture has to do with something that's in a workplace where people enter into a door and arrive there. I think that we have a culture, whether we are remote, whether we're in the same office, whether in the same country, culture is different from that. How I see corporate culture or workplace culture or organizational culture is this. Corporate culture is what our behaviors that we exhibit and we allow to take place inside the workplace. It is the people who are either on the Zoom calls or inside the buildings, how they act and interrelate with each other, communicate, listen, fail to listen. That is the culture. What are we approving? What are we uh, enforcing? What are we giving bonuses for? What are we tracking on a performance review? That is what corporate culture is. It's how we act, our normative values inside of our environment. Often people think of workplace culture as one homogenous way that people act. But as you think about this, corporate culture can be many different cultures inside of one organization with one overarching type of culture that's also going on. When you see larger organizations, there's subcultures where there's different behaviors. Maybe this is a fully virtual team. This is a hybrid team. This is an in-person. These people are doing lunches. These people do recognition ceremonies. All different little subcultures inside of an environment. In the end though, it is the values that are overarching the organization, the things that are being enforced, the things that are being tracked. And that means as it relates to behavior, relationships, all of those things on your performance review, on your bonuses, what are the things that you are appraising and what are the things that you are saying no to? Culture is all the inner workings between people inside of your organization. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. This way you can be a leader who leads by example and also builds a winning culture in the process. Be well. All right. So I really like that video because uh, I'm going to tell you guys a little secret. You know, I've been doing this for a while and this is what I usually do when I go into organizations and how we kind of assess the culture. There's multiple ways to assess the culture, but when I'm invited to these org um, companies, every person that I come in contact with, I ask them, what's the culture like here? How, what's the vibe, what, you know? And I am listening to see if I get a different answer from everybody that I ask that question to. So I either get a different answer from every single person or I get the generic, you know, our mission is to blah, blah, blah. Our values are to blah, blah, blah. But if I ask them one additional question, one extra layer than what they have been taught to say, I ask, what does that mean? How do, how do you live that out every day? They can never answer that question because sometimes we just have these vague words that is our mission, our vision, and our value. But what does that truly mean to the receptionist? What does that truly mean to the um, assistant or the intern? Like, what are they doing? Because words mean different things to different people. I always tell this story. I had a meeting in New York, a whole bunch of powerful people. You know, I didn't even know I was in the room. I deserved to be in the room. But <laughs> I was talking to someone, and he goes, yeah, this weekend I'm going to go get a grill. And I, from the South, of course, thinking, oh, you're about to get a grill? <laughs> like, where are you going, John? You know, I, my family's from Louisiana, but born and raised in Houston. And he looked at me, and he's like, a grill? Like, to grill food. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, my bad. <laughs> so when we say safety first or accountability, you are leaving it up to your employees to interpret what that means. One thing that I always see with companies is like trust and integrity and accountability. How can we tell my six-year-old son Maverick to embody trust? What does trust mean? What is he doing? You know, so it's those words, we gotta take it a step further. 
And I wanted to give you an example of what Vogue Professional Services our culture standards are. We have eight culture standards that we live by. They look like respond promptly, ownership and accountability, be prepared, always be learning, we're from the South, servant leadership, lead with excellence, be agile and work hard. But the thing that separates it is you can ask any VO employee what excellence is and they'll be able to tell you. You can ask them what ownership and accountability is, and they can say ownership and accountability means that we never give assignments to anybody without a due date and who's it assigned to. That's what it looks like. It means if you cannot meet that deadline, you have to tell the person and you give options to that. It's standard. We're asking questions about our standards in interviews. We're asking questions about it when we're doing performance. Our performance review looks like this. Did they do respond promptly? Which means if you get an email, you have to respond within four hours. Immediately, of course. But if you're doing something, you have to respond within four hours. So that's what we are praising. We're making sure that these behaviors are what they're doing. Another thing companies will say is we invest in our employees and continue education. And then I ask them, can I see your Excel sheet? Because if you, your expense sheet, because if you are not investing into your employees with your dollars, then that's really not something you care about. You're just saying it. <laughs> and so we have to go a step further when it comes to our company culture and being very explicit on the behaviors that we mean. If we say that we're a safe company, what does safety mean? Because you have to be able to communicate what your culture is. Um, so this next slide. I'm an entrepreneur just like you guys, right? And I always promise myself when I get on stage, because I've been to you know, webinars and workshops and conferences, and they always tell you like why it's important or what's the problem, but they don't tell you how to do it. And so I really am so passionate about us walking away, and you can be able to implement this in your company like now, okay? So I want to give you the implementation plan. And so the implementation plan looks like defining the behaviors we want to see. Of course, it looks like educating our employees. And then we want to repeat and embody. So usually around 10 to 12 is the standard, the number of standards that I usually see with organizations. And they fo we focus on one standard a week either a weekly or bi-weekly cadence. And so I showed you earlier, we have that um, always be learning. We're gonna focus on that culture for one week. When we have meetings, we talk about what is our standard of the week. When we're doing our interactions, we're telling stories. We're reporting out. If you're always be learning, somebody needs to report on what they've learned. So those are the things that you do. You just don't come up with these 12 ways of doing things and post it on your website and forget about it. It's embodied in everything we do. You get kudos based on your standards and you get reprimanded based on those standards. So that's how you realistically change the culture of your organization. And so one thing that we created is the software to connect it to it because I've been in the plant field in the world, I mean, um, plant world, and there's always this disconnect between home office and like people working remote and all of this. So how can we use technology to, to make sure that there's no gap when it comes to the culture? So you'll see things like gamifications. Um, you always know that somebody knows something if they can pass a test on it, get quizzed on, or if they are teaching somebody else. So some of the, those are some of the things that is in Connect Pro. So everything we're doing moving forward is gonna be tied to our roadmap. This is where the hard work starts. But before that, we're when gonna- When you put people together in a room, there is a vibe. That vibe either feels good or feels bad. If it feels good, what you're feeling is good culture. If it feels bad, what you're feeling is a bad culture. Now, in a business environment, this is the difference between high performance and low performance. One of the hardest things I had to do in my business, I had to let go of a team member who did that role in my company better than anyone I've ever worked with in the last 16 years. They were the best, and I had to let them go because they didn't fit in the culture. 
their performance, although exceptional, was great, but the way that they held their space, the behaviours that they demonstrated was fostering resentment in other team members. And all of a sudden we went from having no conflict, everyone getting on board, and all of a sudden tension started to poke up. And then resentment started to poke up. And you want to cut it before it gets to the gossip stage, which is where people start talking behind closed doors, not openly and honestly. Hardest thing I ever did was have to get rid of someone who was the absolute best at what they did. But I did it to protect the culture. You know, there's a saying, no one man is more important than the mission. And please don't think culture is something you get right once and then it's done forever. Culture is a very fragile ecosystem. Much like when you're, um, I'm brewing, I'm going through this phase right now, I'm brewing kombucha. Awesome, right? It's such an incredible thing. But what I've learned through the process of learning how to brew is that cultural environment is so sensitive that all it takes is one fruit fly to get in there and it can spoil a 10 litre batch. One tiny little fucker like this big, right? It gets in your mix, it can fuck up 10 litres. And here's the thing, if you don't check it regularly, you won't even know until it's too late. Your culture in your business is exactly the same. It's not just set and forget. You have to be constantly checking in and checking the temperature of the culture. And the moment you see a fruit fly flies in and it lands on the Scooby, you immediately take action and you don't wait. This is our philosophy for recruitment. High slow, fire fast. We take our time when it comes to recruiting, but the moment we realize someone isn't a fit, we don't wait to remove them. We have the conversation immediately and we either get them to self-select or we deselect them. What I've learned about people with a bad attitude is it's infectious. It's like a virus. It can take anywhere between 7 to 30 days to spoil a great culture in a business. 7 to 30 days to take a great culture and turn it on its head. It can happen that fast. And here's what I've learned. There is no person too important in your business that you can't deselect or self-select. Nobody. Nobody. Fire everyone in your business mentally at least every 6 to 12 months and then ask yourself the question, would I hire them back? So I actually want us to go ahead and do that. Let's mentally fire everyone, including ourselves, in our head. And then I want us to pay attention to the, all the names that we, without a doubt, like, yeah, I hired Sarah, Robin, da 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 back. I just think it's so powerful, the names you easily said and the names you had to kind of think about or hesitate, you know? So is it worth it? If they're not a good company fit, then let's just go ahead and move on. (laughs) Okay, so um, when we do our culture work, we've noticed that there's 16 different type of culture paradigms. This looks like 16 different type of attributes that we normally see in cultures. For the sake of time, I'm just highlighting five of them, and we're gonna use this as a reference when we do our roadmap. So I'm gonna go over them. We have the strategist and the behaviors that a strategist embodies is they streamline meeting times by setting clear agendas in advance. Those are some of the attributes. So effectiveness and preparedness is what the strategist embodies. The pioneer, they do dependence and um, initiative. So they choose to tackle tasks and problems without waiting for detailed instructions. And then we have the beacon, which is all about transparency and openness. And so sharing project updates regularly with stakeholders. And then the guardian, it's integrity. So they adhere strictly to companies ethic codes, even if they need to lose business. And then we have the bridge there about collaboration. So they do joint projects and they include different departments. Again, we're gonna reference these five paradigms when we go through our culture roadmap. Now, I would be remiss if we talk about good cultures and not address the bad cultures. This is something that we see. And so if you are a product of this, just raise your hand and come see me in the back. So we have the blame culture and their behaviors look like avoiding responsibility, 
finger pointing during failure, lack of transparency, and a high level of mistrust amongst employees. That's what the blame culture looks like. We have the siloed culture, and this looks like lack of cooperation between departments. And you see, like, you're constantly redoing work because why nobody's communicating. So it's duplicate efforts. And you will actually hear people say, that's not my job. They have that attitude. If you are the person that says that, <laughs> you may be in a siloed culture. You guys just don't talk to each other. And this last one, this last one is really crucial. It's a fear-based culture. And so it's high stress level and there's low innovation and employees only stick to safe tasks. They don't want to do anything because they are in fear of making a mistake. And, then, and so there's no success in that type of culture. And so those are the, the, the top three bad cultures that we do not want to um, embody or foster, you know, stay away from the bad cultures. Okay, so now we're going to have our roadmap. We have our papers in front of us and we have our clipboard. And I understand that this is the first time you guys are seeing this. So I'm going to go over an example for you guys so you can know, you know, the right mindset to do this. So the first thing we want to do is we want to assess our current culture. And of course, my fake company is company ABC. And I'm going to talk through my example, and then I'll give you some time to do yours. And then we're going to have a sharing is caring. So I will call on someone to go ahead and share um, what they came up with. And so my current culture is we're building the plane and flying at the same time. We are winging it. We're just trying to survive. That's where we at. And so the key um, attributes of this current culture is we are adaptable. We can respond quickly to change and we can customize things. And the strengths are that we provide flexibility and we are truly customer focused. All right, the, the area of improvement. <laughs> we need robust systems, we need SOPs, we just need better organization because we build in a plane and find it at the same time. Crazy. And so the second one is define the desired culture. So in order for me to get to where I'm going, I'm going to probably need to tap, tap on the strategist and the guardian. Because remember, the strategist is all about efficiency and preparedness. And then the guardian is about integrity and accountability. So those are the two culture paradigms that I'm going to pull on for my desired culture. And so then I want to think about my business strategy. Be very specific. I want to hire some new staff. I need some people. I am working in my business and on my business. So me as a leader, I want to switch from that lead and not operate. And you can't operate and lead at the same time. And so if I want to be a true leader, I want to lead and not be operating in my business. So that's a mindset shift that I'm going to need to embody. And then I also want to increase my profits by 35%. I want you guys to be that specific. And then we're going to talk about how these um, behaviors support the, the attributes. And so if I embody the strategist, I'm going to be accountable and structured and then streamline those operations and increase efficiency. And then the next four is embodying new behaviors. So I need to be very clear and strategic on my decision making. I need to be accountable in task and organized in my discipline. And so the ways to do that is I'm going to get some SOPs. I want to make sure that I'm doing something over and over again the same type of way. Because in order to grow, you have to be repeatable. And so you can't be doing that widget differently every single time. When we get new employees, how are we going to teach them how to do that widget? If it's like, oh, sometimes I do it this way, sometimes I do it that way. We want to standardize our operations. And then here's the number five is developing the plan. So we want to define the objectives, communicate the vision, and then train and deploy. Something about the timeline. It takes 
three to five years to change a culture. I only put three because I didn't want to, you know, sticker shock you guys. But it takes truly three to five years to change a culture. And if you remember in the video, who remembers how long it takes to, um, to destroy a culture? Does anybody remember in the video? Seven to 30. Seven to 30 days to destroy a culture and it takes three years to change a culture. That's how important it is. And that's why I truly believe these businesses are getting it wrong because we want that quick fix. We want to throw performance management. We want to throw smart goals at it. We want to throw training at it. <laughs> I always go into these companies and they want training. And I'm like, we're not going to fix the problem, but OK. <laughs> so really think about like the phases and the plan that it needs. And then we have evaluate and adjust. So I'm going to give you guys five minutes to go ahead and go through your cultural roadmap. I'm going to put it back on the uh, cultural paradigm so you can reference those and really think about where your business needs to go and what type of culture you need to embody to get to those goals. All right. No worries if you're not done because you can think of the spot. So <laughs> we're going to go ahead and let somebody share what their roadmap was. Oh, I'm just going to start picking people, guys. Yeah. I taught middle school, so I have no problem with awkwardness. I don't yet have a business, so I went. Um, Perfect. If I were to create a school, I would want it to be a place that's collaborative where we're not only encouraging students to collaborate, but teachers to exchange information and collaborate and learn from one another as well. So that would be the desired culture. I love it. I want to take a step further. You can keep it to her and say, so we say collaborate. What do we want them to actually do? And this is how we create standards. So I'm, what's the name of the company you're going to create? It would be called Harambe Head Start. So this is going to be Harambe's way. And the first standard would be, what, what, what would you want the teachers to do? I would want there to be a space built out in the day where they actually get together and lay out lesson plans and look at them together. I love it. Yeah, mm -hmm. see, see the difference, um, very specific on what we want to do, because now we can hold them accountable for that culture. That standard is on Tuesdays at three, we come together and we review lessons plans. And that's one of our culture standards. I love it. Thank you. Gentlemen, stop, stop fighting. It's so exciting. <laughs> I can't wait to hear your voice. Oh, Here we go. Okay. What's your name? Aaron wants to share his brilliance. Congratulations, Aaron. <laughs> okay, um, I kind of just stepped in like halfway. Okay. So I, I really don't know <laughs> what we're doing, but um, <laughs> uh, I own a few things. Okay. But um, one of the things I do own is, is customer facing. Okay. Um, so it's very interactive. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I guess my, my culture uh, paragraph, uh, paradigm would be like uh, micro leadership with uh, emphasis on customer experience. Mm -hmm. um, and so we want to think about our employees. Do you have employees right, right now? Yeah. Okay. When it comes to customer facing, what do you uh, want them to be? Do you want them to be open? I want warm? them to be, you know, open, um, uh, warm, and knowledgeable. So when we think about that, what what is warm? And let's think about it. You're talking to my six-year-old child, and we want to tell him, I need you to be warm to these customers. What is he doing? Or um, what are they doing? They're more, um, more greeting, uh, um, listening, uh, pretty much just curating that experience. Mm -hmm. That's what. I have a, a company in New York, and mm -hmm. one of their standards is, um, what's the name of it? 
I forget, it's like Kavi Way. But one of their standards is to say good morning in the morning. All right. They're from New York. So we literally like drill down this same exci um, excitement and they don't speak to each other when they no. walk in. No. And so one of the standards is we say good morning when we walk into some place. And that's what they do. And they talk about, you know, the behaviors that we want to see. Because if we're saying we're being open and warming, they also, because they deal with, like, violence. It's very, not the company, but <laughs> what they deal with is violence. And so um, integrity looks like when you say good morning, you respond and you're, like, genuine. So we're very clear on the behaviors. But I love that. You also mentioned... Um, you said openness, and what was the other word you said? Um, shoot. Uh, I had micro leadership. Micro leadership? Yeah. So explain, <laughs> what is micro leadership? Um, so I was in the Marine Corps, and so like small unit leadership is like something that we just we just do, right? And so that's what I instill in people. I, I instill that, hey, small unit leadership, this is your leader, this is how you communicate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, chain of command, blah, 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 blah. Um, I love that. We have another company, and they have that. They call it something like servant leadership. But yep. basically, everyone is a leader. And the way they embody that is if you get a task, you take ownership of it, and you have to see it through to the end. And so momentum, all of that is going on with leadership. So thank you so much for my two people that shared with me. We did a little bit. Um, I wanted y'all to visibly see what I was doing. And so we take the desired behaviors and we turn it into standards. And I'll use my example. When we say integrity and trust and all of those things, imagine you're talking to my six-year-old. What do we want them to actually do? And that is the culture we want to create. So before we go, I just want one person to say that one thing that they're going to start doing and stop doing because of this workshop. I'm going to call on you. <laughs> you felt it. I felt it. <laughs> um, I am a creative person, so my mind is all over the place, and I'm terrible at project management, like terrible at time blocking. Um, but everyone keeps telling me I have to do time blocking. It's, yeah. Uh, so I really want to try and focus on doing that. Okay. Um, and then what was the other thing? One thing you'll stop doing. You are lucky I'm out of time because that is a word right there. So I hope y'all caught it, and that is my time. Thank you. Miracle, thank you so much. That's her time, but you can still act.